Good morning. I'm Glenn Lowry, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this preview and conversation about Francis Picabia. Uh, I want to acknowledge immediately uh, several colleagues who are here, especially Catherine Hugues, who co-organized the exhibition at Kunsthaus Zurich, uh, Beverly Calte from the Comité Picabia, and William Canfield, also from the Comité Picabia, plus all of the other friends and colleagues who supported Anne Umland on this remarkable project. We're also very grateful to the sponsors who made the exhibition possible. Uh, as always, uh, we want to thank them, the International Council, Lawrence Benison, Farrell and Ball. You can't do anything without Farrell and Ball. Um, an indemnity from the Federal Council on the Arts and Humanities and the Museum of Modern Art's own exhibition fund. So one of the things that's so fascinating to me, at least, about Picabia is that he is not one person, but many people. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's start with, at the very least, the two Picabias that I know, the Picabia that we're familiar with and the Picabia that we're unfamiliar with. So tell us first about the Picabia we think we know and then about the Bacavia we don't know. All right. Well, I'll have to venture a guess at the Bacavia that you know, but by that, I'm going to presume that you mean the avant-garde Bacavia, the Bacavia who is associated with the Dada movement, exactly. the Bacavia who's the maker of machine images, um, and then there is the rest of Bacavia. So there's Bacavia, the after-the-fact impressionist, there's Bacavia, the pioneering abstract painter. I mean, we could go through. I probably shouldn't do a laundry list because it's there's okay. There's so I, many of them. There, there are so many of them, and you know, we've been thinking a, a lot in putting together this show about how to help our audience. Like, what are the ways to prepare people for the diversity that they're going to encounter? So I'm going I'm to go around in circles because Bacavia authorizes me to do that. Our heads are round. I mean, our heads are round, so our thoughts can change direction. I think going into this project, one of the things that interested me in particular about Bacabia and many of our colleagues here at the institution is the way that in his stylistic diversity and in the way that he ranges between writing, poetry, painting, film, he is particularly contemporary in, in his sensibility. So that was a reason for wanting to see what happens when you lay this whole career out in toto. Um, and then back to the familiar, the familiar avant-gardist, and then the, the rest, um, I suppose the parts that are the least familiar, or certainly the least familiar to New York City, because they were, there was a, the last big Picabia exhibition in America was held in 1970 at the Guggenheim, exhibit, um, Guggenheim Museum, and it was organized by William Campfield. And at that time, the Guggenheim did not let Dr. Campfield show the photo-based pinup nudes of the 1940s, nor uh, did he include any of the very late crusty abstractions, those reductive dots. And um, so it seemed as though the time had come in our 21st century moment to put it all together, right? And, and then, so those are very unfamiliar because they're not seen here, but so is the beginning. But it seems to me that you quite consciously set out to really emphasize the shape-shifting, each room essentially conforming to a, a kind mm -hmm. of visual moment in Picabia's mm -hmm. career. And mm -hmm. you know, the different ways of thinking about mm -hmm. Picabia, one could look mm -hmm. to trace those aspects that run across the career or emphasize the differences. I, I suppose that is true, but I'd love to think that what I did was simply pull out what is in the work itself. And so right. that the structure of the exhibition, in a way, is at its most traditional because it's chronological and it's monographic. Yeah. And yes, I, I did emphasize the shape shifting in the sense that Betty Fisher, our designer, and I wanted each room to have a, I hate that word bespoke, but that was what we thought. We wanted each room to have a different character to reflect the different character of the work, but it's, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of tracing continuities, then we'd be doing, that's for the next, um, I hope this show inspires 
another 30 exhibitions because there's so much more to do. And I think the challenge would be finding the red threads. Um, you know, you could, you could, to get off on another tangent, you could think about mechanical reproduction and photography, and Picabia, or just photography, pure and simple, and how the career organizes itself um, in relation to that, whether to confront, to challenge, to make use of, to appropriate. So that's sort of a interesting lens. Or you could think about the strategy of superimposition, for instance. So there are, um, but I think what I felt like our, our job was in the sense that there hasn't been in the United States a, a full Picabia retrospective ever, that our job was to lay it out as, as clearly a, as we could and, and chronologically and let the heterogeneity speak for itself. And yes, we amped that up a little bit with the help of Farrow and Ball and some wall colors and some great exhibition spaces, but it, but it really, I, I hope, is true to the is true to the work. Well, I think it's very convincing, and I think mm -hmm. one of the things that is so pleasing about this exhibition is the element of surprise, because even if you're familiar with Picabia's work from having seen uh, the exhibition in Zurich, mm -hmm. there's something about. Um, how rapidly and convincingly he shifts directions. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the beginning and a little bit about the end. So how does he get from those, you know, post-impressionist-like paintings that uh, at best would have created perhaps an, a forgettable career mm -hmm. to uh, an artist who is at the forefront of the avant-garde mm -hmm. in such a short period mm -hmm. of time, what, what happens to it? Mm -hmm. So I think there are probably a number of different ways to answer that. And I'm conscious that George Baker, our catalog author who wrote about that period, is sitting in the audience. So afterwards, I hope if I um, say something you disagree with, please speak up. But I think there's, I think Bacabia, he meets a woman named Gabrielle Buffet, who is a musician and a composer. So I think she's an incredible, has an incredible impact on him. And the idea of music as a model for going somewhere else mm -hmm. with um, non-objective painting or finding a different model for art making is key. He meets some kind of great guys like Guillaume Apollinaire and Marcel Duchamp. And I remember Leah Dickerman's Inventing Abstraction show tells the story of the famous car ride where those guys all go off in the summer of 1912 to Jura and they come back and have completely changed the way that they work. So um, I think it's something in the air in Paris. Picabi is not the only one making the leap to non-objective painting in 1912. There's Leger or Kupka. Um, Picasso and Brock are certainly artists whose work was known to him. So I think that confluence of factors and probably in many others that I'm not, not naming catapulted him. But right. it is an amazing transformation. It is. I mean, I think the other thing, back to this photographic threat, it's going beyond, right? Yeah. That's the moment to go beyond, beyond photography, beyond mimeticism, just yeah. um, to go in the other opposite, opposite direction. So if we leap towards yes. the end uh -huh. uh, and speak for a moment about mm -hmm. the, those paintings that were excluded mm -hmm. from uh, the Guggenheim show, but more mm -hmm. importantly, that have become in the last decade, mm -hmm. uh, very much sought after. Uh, they're, they're troubling paintings. Do you, which ones are you referring to? I'm talking about the to? sort of paintings the from the 19, early 1940s. The 40s, the photo-based you know, paintings. The photo-based paintings mm -hmm. that, you know, draw on kitsch on, mm -hmm. you know. Soft porn. Soft porn, porn magazines. Mm -hmm. So phrase your question about those again. The, what, what is it about those paintings today that oh. has us reconsidering them as much as we are? Well, I think for me, so those paintings reemerged. I think the first time they were shown in a major exhibition was in 76 at the Grand Palais. And then a lot of artists began looking at them and thinking they were interesting, right? right? And I think for me, the, the fact that they are photo-based is one of the things that makes them so compelling. I think the fact that they were repressed for so many years is also compelling because it makes me think about who was making those judgments about what to show and what not, not, not to show. And I know 
uh, last night, oh, this is a real digression. I'm in Digressions of, are always good. Yeah, I went to the um, talk with Susan Cahan and Lowry, um, Lowry Sims here last night about, oh, anyway, they were talking about abstraction, that the way in the 60s and the 70s, abstraction was destiny, mm -hmm. right? And so you could just imagine that in William Rubin's Museum of Modern Art, those, those nudes would not have had a place. And I just feel as though, um, for me today, I firmly believe that modern art is more open-ended and more capacious, right? right? Then, and that those nudes, because they are photo-based and they're composite images and they look ahead to pop art or to appropriation art, or and they allow for um, thinking about things that are avant-garde and kitchen figuration, all in the same mindset, they're really compelling. And then, and then I suppose, I'm also interested in their history and their historical moment and how those two coincide. And, yeah. Well, and I think it's part of what makes uh, Pacabia so compelling today, mm -hmm. that he's treading in areas that, on the one hand, make you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, are clearly slippery, right? He's a, the, at least I read him as mm -hmm. a very slippery artist. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I've come to think, and this may be oversimplifying, but I find it helpful to keep in mind when looking at Bacavia that he did live through these two world wars. Yeah. And that up to the abstractions, there still is that moment. I think, I, I just remember feeling it so palpably in Picasso. There's this moment before World War I breaks out when everything is possible. And that's where he gets you to in the, with the big abstractions. And then the war hits and everything changes. And that's when the machine imagery comes in. That's mm -hmm. when the idea of the artist is machine. Of, and that, although this show tries to make an argument that there is much more to Picabia than his justly celebrated Dada years, I do think in the sense, in a certain sense, those years are formative in that that's where the resistance to a fixed position mm -hmm. is born. That nationalisms are to be contested, cultural values are to be things that things that are static and unchanged are to, are to be resisted. And that that for me is a way of understanding the, sh the programmatic shape-shifting yeah. over the course of the career. Because he's also a, n a nihilist, right? He's yeah. like struggling with the meaninglessness of life. I must yeah. go on, yeah. I can't go on sort of thing. Um, so I don't know how, I, I think I lost, I lost the question at the end of that. Not uh, at all. Uh, um, film, clearly film, critical. Yes. Uh, yeah. Talk about that for a moment. Yeah, he's interesting. I mean, he was writing, um, in, uh, what do you call them, screen, screenplays uh, for films before he got to make that first one in 24, and he wrote other ones afterwards, but that 24 seemed to be the moment when the stars aligned mm -hmm. and he had the money and the wherewithal to make that crazy movie, Entreact, with Rene Claire and Eric Satie for that ballet. And I think that Jean-Jacques Lavelle, another one of our catalog authors, argues that film and that film, Entreact in particular, is the key to the entire career and you can take that or, or, or leave that, but in the sense of the abrupt jump cuts or the use of superimposition or the recurrence of circles or target motifs, all that sort of thing, they are, they are, they are an entr'act. And certainly the, by the time you get to the transparencies in the late 20s, what he's doing is taking strategies from avant-garde photography and film and writing them large on canvas. And creating at least visual images that I don't, I can't think of anyone else at that moment who's doing quite the same thing in painting. Yes, I, I can't either. And I, I'm there, I ask that question of everyone who walks through the show, can you think of a, a, a precedent? Because I don't want to make a, a, a claim that isn't, that isn't founded. I can think of Max Ernst layering things, but mm. in painting on that scale, sources from mm. so many diverse places, for me, that's, that's what Bacabia he pioneered yes. that. And I think that for him, certainly those transparencies, that moment was as important for him, looking retrospectively back at his career, as, as the big abstractions at the beginning that he was so um, pr proud of. Yeah. So when, you, when I think of um, Picabia in the teens, mm -hmm. uh, he's clearly in a conversation with 
you know, a critical group of mm -hmm. artists, mm -hmm. uh, musicians. Mm -hmm. um, but those paintings, has you know, when he gets into the 30s and 40s, who's he? Who who is he in conversation with? Yeah, that is a good question, because he's in the south of France, so he's sort of taken himself out of the active circles um, in Paris of critical friends and commentators. We know in the 30s he's writing a lot to Gertrude Stein. Mm -hmm. That's one, one friend of his. Um, and I don't know who the other interlocutors are in those years, in fact. No, I mean, I cert well, certainly with the, uh, up through the transparencies, the surrealists, Andre right. Breton, well, and I course. think Duchamp is a lifelong friend. Um, so tho those are constants. But it's later that you really, it, it's like he's off on his own. I think, I mean, I wonder too, I think those years with all respect, there's just a lot of work still to be done, I yeah. think, on the 30s and 40s in Picabia's yeah. career. I, I think that the, um, the reception history hasn't been carefully examined. I think a lot of the exhibition history of those, I just think there's a lot of work to be done, and I imagine, and there may be um, people in the audience too afterwards can, can answer that question better than I, I can, but I, I have a sense that we, art historians have a lot of work to do to, to, to put those works in context and to figure out the biographical connections and things. Which I think is one of the great things about an exhibition like this. Mm -hmm. It opens up a career because y you'd be hard pressed to find another figure from uh, the first part of the 20th century uh, who can feel as fresh and as unknown mm -hmm. today as Picabia, mm -hmm. given that we actually know Picabia from a certain moment. And yes. that's the part that I think is so fascinating is mm -hmm. that he, that, and that's part of what I mean by slipperiness, that there's, mm -hmm. because he's so capable of shifting directions, mm -hmm. and actually once he shifts, mastering what he does, mm -hmm. that there's a high degree of accomplishment mm -hmm. across the career. Yes, yes, and I think that, just true confession, surprised me a yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just, uh, I've said this to a number of people as I traveled around and I looked at works, I just was, What's the word? I'm going to say moved um, at his, I don't want to say moved, I'll get sentimental. I was struck by his, the power of his pictures, even when he's trying to make like the worst, the baddest pictures, they're still, they're, there's something about them that really is engaged. Um, yeah, and, and, and that, that I guess mastery is a word or that he has this, I don't care, but yet I care deeply attitude. Um, so do you read yeah. those later paintings as ironic? Do you think, uh, you said baddest pictures, and I assume you're meaning towards like the kitschy the side kitschy of his, side. Yeah. his practice. Yeah. Um, is he the, I don't know, Glenn. That's part of the slipper, I, slippery yeah. part. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I think, I was talking to Carol Dunham about mm -hmm. them, and he said to me, well, for me, I think the question of irony or sincerity or all of that with Bacabi is kind of behind the, beside the point. He's being true to himself now. What, maybe what that's, does that mean? What does that mean? But, but, but somehow he is, and that, that's different from irony. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that he makes works that you always have that question, is he being ironic? Mm -hmm. So let's, before we open this mm -hmm. up to, to colleagues in the audience, talk for a moment about the very late paintings, the, the mm -hmm. dots, the mm -hmm. return to something that's mm -hmm. on the surface at least very abstract. And yes. you know, why and what is he doing? Well, yes, Picabia never won, as we've seen, to um, shun a change in direction, goes back to Paris after the war in 45, and he promptly announces that figurative art is dead, and he returns to making these abstractions, but they're very different from mm. anything that came before. And I think um, I'm very excited to hear what people say about them because the surfaces are so complex, and he's clearly carrying on this practice of overpainting and of mm. superimposition 
in the abstractions. And in that sense, it's easy, or we, we have more information about those, that he's looking at Dubuffet or Fautrier or Vols mm -hmm. or Hartung. He's engaged with the younger generation of art informel. So that's one way of, um, he's both looking back to his past and he's engaging with that present post-war Paris idiom. It's interesting to think, too, that it's in Paris in the, after the war that those two big 1913 abstractions, mm -hmm. Udni and Et Tao Nizel, are rediscovered, mm -hmm. and they're brought out and seen as precedents for the new abstraction in, in post-war Europe. So it's, um, I think that's, he's like thinking about his past as an abstract artist, he's looking at contemporaries, and he's continuing to play with overpainting, but now in this much more subterranean, complicated, hidden, masked, veiled way. And those dot paintings, I just wish I could have seen the show. You know, he did a whole show, it was just called Point in 1949, that was supposed to have some 50 of the dots, so we tried to reunite as a sizable group just to get across from that. And I don't think that critics then, critics in interpreted them as neo-dada, right, and as nihilist. Right. And, um, I'm not so sure. I, d I, I read them totally differently for whatever it's worth. I, th I find them surprisingly uplifting. There's almost something, not playful, but and, and certainly I don't want to charge the term spiritual with uh -huh. over-freighting, but there's something I find startlingly hopeful about them. Yes, I would use that word too, and I just, I honestly can't tell you if it's just that at the end of last week we were so desperate, I'm, forgive me, to the audience for some, right. for some hope um, right. but, uh, that, that, that they spoke that way. But I, I was, I didn't expect that in the last gallery, yeah. that yeah. there would be um, an uplift yeah. to those. There's something effervescent yeah. about them for all their Nietzschean yes. titles. Yeah. So. Well, strange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Over to all of you, uh, please. And as we pass around a microphone for anyone who has a question, I just want to underscore uh, what I hope was self-evident from the beginning, which is what an extraordinarily gifted and talented curator Anne Umland and her team are, and what a brilliant and beautiful exhibition you have wrought for us. Thank you. Please. This is Lara Malvesi from the Spanish Newswire. I feel like uh, I have seen that, that there are many paintings uh, with the Spanish theme. I would like to know what it means, the Barcelona period uh, for Picabia, and what are the influences and the cultural uh, themes and, and the influence of his Spanish roots in Picabia. Thank you. Yes, so Picabia and Spain. So that can be answered on multiple levels, and I'll kind of try to stay on track for you. I think the first thing always to mention is that Picabia was born in Paris. His mother was French, but his father was a Cuban-born Spaniard, and so there's always that identification with Spanish culture that's just part of who he is and that he liked to play up. I think that, yes, throughout the show, from the teens on, recognizable, stereotypical images of uh, Spanish subjects begin to appear, or he writes them out, like in The Spanish Night. He, as you say, he goes to Barcelona in 1917. It's one of his stops uh, during the war where he publishes the first four issues of his journal, 391. And then he goes back there again on that wonderful road trip with Andre Breton and Simone Breton in 1922 for his exhibition at the Galeries Dalmau, which I think historians have come to see as really a, a manifesto of sorts of Pica uh, Picabia's, I almost said Picasso, of Picabia's refusal, right, of any single style and of making very evident at that moment that he considered abstraction to just be one choice amongst many, just as um, sort of kitschy Spanish ladies and beautiful optical images were. I think as you go on through the career, certainly with the later transparencies, some of the earliest of those works are pictures on paper where he visited, I think, Barcelona in the late 
20s, someone here would have a, a precise date for you. And he looked at a number of Catalan Romanesque paintings, and so that is one of the sources that he, he quotes in those works. So I think, I wish someone, I would love to see, this is like my moment to throw out exhibition ideas for people, um, someone just to do a show on Picabia in Spain. You know, that would be really interesting or to, to bring together all the Spanish ladies and Toreadors, just because they're, they're questions about their dates. They begin much earlier, I think, than, than is generally acknowledged. Um, and it's just a fascinating, it's a fascinating subject. Um, I'm sure, I don't know, maybe Picasso plays in there too as the leading Spanish artist of the Parisian avant-garde. Yes, up here, and then we'll go into the back. Okay. Hello, um, I'm from Bengali Press, Bengali community, and I'm just wondering, um, such a multi-talented artist, and I'm so moved and touched. Sorry. No, not a, I've been like that many times the last few days. <laughs> such a multi-dimension artist. I just want to know if he has done anything with the sculpture. Oh, not that I know of. I think the closest he gets to something in space, three-dimensional, is that funny empty frame with string in it that's positioned in the yeah, exhibition. Yeah. So that, and I suppose, it's not really sculpture. There's the wonderful relief picture called Very Rare Picture on the Earth that is here from the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice. But right, no, he's not, he didn't. It's also the Yale picture, right? Well, Where, that's true. That which, yes. is, which is, in fact, quite sculptural. It's, it is. The, so Glenn's referring to the Promenade des Anglais that has that crazy snakeskin frame designed by Pierre Legrand. And then Picabia has used macaroni and feathers and little yeah. bits of leather. Yeah. So. Yes, um, but collage, collage, but yeah, it's, 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 it's um, very, very pronounced in its um, materiality. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering, since he has done so much work of you know, such a different area of the life, and maybe he might have sculpture, you know, that is my question. Yeah, I mean, m maybe, but I, is anyone else out there amongst all those Picabia experts in the audience? I've never seen a... Set designs, that's true, set designs. And so, right, and he choreographed dancers, so that's um, working in a Moving spatial sculpture. dimension. Yeah, thank you for the thank question. You. I think there was a question in the back here. Yeah, hi, um, it's Vincent Katz from Brooklyn Rail and other places. Uh, beautiful show and amazing installation, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of poetry in Picabia's life, uh, his own practice as a poet, but also his relationship to other poets and the publications of which there are so many beautiful examples in the exhibition. Yes. All right. So I will talk about that, but with a caveat that I am not a, a literary scholar. I, I am an appreciator of Picabia as a writer, and I know that it was an important, he considered it an important part of his artistic practice, so I very much wanted that represented in the show. As, even if you think of things that are as literal as his writing the titles of his works onto his abstractions, the interplay between text and image or the use of text as a, a form in a concrete way is clearly an important aspect of what Picabia does. Now, he's friends with Apollinaire. Um, I know he's reading Apollinaire's poetry. I, I, I would refer you to Mark Lowenthal's beautiful book, I Am a Beautiful Monster, which is the English translations of Picabia's writings as a great introduction to, to that subject. Not to, not to dodge it, but I just can't really answer with authority. If that yes. helps, maybe you've read that. Maybe. 
it's another example of <coughs> how he pushes the boundaries of what an artist is. So I just mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wanted and, to. Yeah, and I think um, I'm sure a number of the strategies that he uses must have connections to other avant garde poets. Um, you know, inversion, sort of writing a phrase one way and then writing it backwards, which is another form of abstraction, of course, too, if you want, want to think about it that way. So I think, again, this exhibition was intended to try to map a terrain for Picabia that ranged widely with the hope that it inspired people to ask questions just like that and then to, to dig more deeply. Anything just quickly on the publications, the, the collaborative aspects of the publications mm -hmm. that he was involved with that are mm -hmm. in the exhibition? Yes, so I think collaboration is a very important word to think of with Picabia, back to those red, red threads. Um, so working on those magazines from Alfred Stieglitz on was clearly generative for him. In the catalog, Adrian Sudhalter wrote about the publications in relation to the mechanical imagery. And I, I agree with her in a certain sense that the engagement with journal production and mechanical reproduction precedes his making um, images of mechanical things, or they're side and side, and that um, it's both an iconography and it's a, a, a mode of making that is depersonalized, that's a different model for, for what an artist does and makes and acts like. We'll take a question in the middle and then we'll come down. Hi, I'm, I'm Susie Menkes from CNI International. And I was very interested in the overlay paintings, which is what I would call them, um, that came just near the end. And I was really astounded because this is something that we see kids doing uh, with a computer. We could all do it. It's so simple. And there was no computer then. Am I right in thinking that he was very advanced, or are there actually other people through history, the uh, history of art, who have used this kind of technique? Well, this, we were talking about that a little bit. I think for, for Glenn, and, Glenn and I, or I myself, I have only been able to think of examples in film and in photography of that type of superimposition. And as far as I know, but I stand ready to be proved wrong, um, Picabia is the first on a large scale to really be playing with superimposition, with overlay, with contour drawings, with seeing one thing through another. And I think that he must have relished the way that you could collapse time and era and source material. I mean, to put the nudie photo picture from a nudie photograph up there with a Botticelli um, Salome. You know, sort of the sacred and the profane was something that he could achieve um, that I, I don't remember seeing in any other Painter, I think you, you know, there certainly are palimpsests, right? Mm -hmm. That's um, that I, I, you, you could find precedents outside of the realm of paintings for the wall, um, but but he's the only one that I I know of who made paintings like that prior to Sigmar Polka yeah. or people who came afterwards. Hi. Hi, uh, Phyllis Tuckman. I'm I'm asking this question more from the vantage point of having studied Dada and Surrealism with William S. Rubin. And congratulations on giving us the full picture today. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing uh, to see what you have accomplished with this exhibition. It makes me wonder, I mean, we're used to all the different phases of Pablo Picasso. What he did, he was constantly changing and people followed. So do we have, I'm trying to think of some clever phrase, but I can't come up with it. Is this the, uh, a parallel development that Picabia is changing as much as Picasso? So I thought about that quite a bit over it, because as you know, I was working on a Picasso show simultaneously with the Picabia show and Yes, they both change, but Picasso, this is oversimplifying, 
But Picasso is always there to show you he can master something. Picasso is an artist, no matter what the style, you do know it is Pablo Picasso who made that. And Picabia, Picasso never goes to radical abstraction. And he never goes to photorealism. Like Picabia shifts are really um, extreme in a way that Picasso just never is. And I do think that in a way, and I wrote this in my catalog essay and it could be argued against, but Picasso and Picabi are almost the same age. Picasso, in fact, is I think he's two years younger than Picabia, but Picabi is the one who's hanging out with the Dadaists. Picabi is the one who's engaging with mechanical reproduction. I mean, Picabi is the one with Duchamp and the others who are really redefining what an art object can be. And this isn't to take, it's just, it's just a different artistic model. And I, Anne Temkin once said to me, and I love, you know, Picasso thinks he's God. And Picabia is a non-believer. And that's, that kind of does it <laughs> for me. Or, or you could yeah. even say, isn't even interested. Isn't even interested, but I, yeah, I don't know. I think he's interested. I think he's a non-believer. Yeah, it's so an, interesting, it's yeah. an interesting question. He, yeah. It's a, yeah. You've touched on you know, the perennial art historical challenge of how do you make sense of a career. And in fact, yes. I think mm -hmm. because Picasso has been you know, studied to mm -hmm. the max, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. has a greater sense of the coherence of the career, whether that's legitimate or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas what's fascinating with Picabia is the challenge of making it coherent. Right. And I just do think that this is, sounds like psychobabble, that with, with, with Picasso, the ego is always dominant. dominant. With Picabia, the ego is always in doubt. That's right. back to the slipperiness. Yeah, right. So it's just it's Which just also different. may make Picabia very much an artist of this moment. I think for me that is is one is true. Yeah. I want to bring this to a close, but uh, Anne will be here for those of you who want to continue asking questions. Thank you so much for joining us, and and once again, congratulations. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you.